Now today, we're going to continue our talks about the learning objectives for facial growth and development, and I brought my trusty here assistant, Fred, to help me demonstrate some of the things we want to talk about. So, chapter number five, growth and function of the TMJ. Learning objectives are to know two anatomic reasons why adults have more problems with their TMJ than children. And the second is to describe rotation and translation in the TMJ. So let's start with the first learning objective. Why do adults have more problems with their temporomandibular joints than children? Well, if we look at the relationship, and this is an adult, so if we look at the temporomandibular joint, and of course there are two, one on the left and then one on the right, if we look at the anatomic structure of the temporomandibular joint in the adult, we see that the glenoid fossa is much deeper in the adult, and the way the condyle fits within the glenoid fossa is much tighter. So it's much easier to damage your joint when there's a lot of constraint of movement. So that is the number one reason why adults have more problems with their temporomandibular joint than children. The second reason has to do with just the flexibility of ligaments and the flexibility of your joints in general when you're a child. So for those two reasons, we generally don't see TMJ problems in children. It is more common in adults. And the anatomic reason is the deepening of the of, of the glenoid fossa and, and, and the restriction of movement of the condylar head. So let's move on and use my friend here and to talk a little bit about the temporomandibular joint. I want you to think of the temporomandibular joint similar to other joints in the body. Okay? So in dentistry, we really only have two joints to worry about, the left temporomandibular joint and the right temporomandibular joint. But they are among the most complex joints in the body. So what do we know in general about the way joints work? Okay. Let me use Fred as an example. If we would look at Fred and we would look at his shoulder, shoulder joint here, we could see that Fred can fully move his shoulder around this articulation and the articulation is not bone to bone but actually has bone cartilage bone. Why? Because we know from our talks about cartilage and bone that bone can't resist pressure. So any place we have an articulation the ends of the bone need to be covered with cartilage we call hyaline cartilage and then often between the two bones there's another cartilage which we call a meniscus. So let's take the shoulder joint as an example before we move on to look, to look at the temporomandibular joint. The shoulder joint is freely movable, rotational joint. And if we were looking at the, the position of the shoulder joint that's determined by the ligaments that support the joint, what we'd have to do is we have to get Fred's arm all the way back here to this point here. Now he's at the ligamentously restrained position of this joint. Obviously, it doesn't function here. So I want you to remember that joints don't function in their ligamentous position. Joints function in the centrally located position. Now, specifically, when we talk about the temporomandibular joint, I'm going to go back to the board here in a minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw, and I'll probably draw this side here, I'm going to draw a cross section showing the external auditory meatus right there, the head of the mandibular condyle, and the glenoid fossa. And with that diagram, I want to show you the difference between rotation, which is the movement of the jaw back like this, and translation, which is the movement of the jaw forward like that. When we chew, our joints are going undergoing both translation and rotation simultaneously. Now, 
What does that look like inside the joint diagrammatically? And that's what I'm going to show you right now. So if we were going to look at, again, we have the external auditory meatus, then we have the glenoid fossa and the articular eminence. So we see here, glenoid fossa, little bump here called articular eminence. External, auditory, hiatus, right here. Okay. Now, to this we're going to add the mandibular condyle. So here we have the condyle, mandibular condyle. I'm just going to look at the neck of the condyle. And I can see Fred left the door open here. We're going to have to shut the door keep all the riffraff out of our meeting today. So what I've drawn here, condyle, glenoid fossa, condylar head, glenoid fossa, articular eminence. And what I want to show now is the part that obviously isn't on the skull because that's the cartilage. And the cartilage that cups over The mandibular condyle, we call it the meniscus. And think of the meniscus, if you had a bicycle helmet and you put the bicycle helmet over your head, you know the helmet is sort of secured underneath your chin, but is able to rotate back and forth like this on top of your head. That's how the meniscus is. It's, it's attached, it's attached here on the neck of the condyle by the capsular ligament. And it's attached here by the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. And the pterygoid muscle also attaches here in a little depression underneath the, the condylar head. So what's happening now in the temporomandibular joint when, you're, when you move? You've got two spaces here. You've got a space between the meniscus and the condylar head, and you've got a space between the meniscus and the glenoid fossa. These two spaces, and of course they're not really spaces because in the body there are no spaces. You learned that in, in gross anatomy when, we, when you dissect the body, you know there are, there's no space. But we call them spaces because they're tissue spaces where tissues can slide. So this inferior joint space, we call it this one right here, inferior joint space and we call the other one the superior joint space and in between those we've got the meniscus so what's happening when we chew what's happening when I talk what's happening when we open and close our mouths well we said that the the mandible rotates and translates. Well, interestingly, rotation occurs in the inferior joint space. So if you want to demonstrate the rotation, if you just take your, your jaw down and just open straight back like that, that's rotation. And that rotation is occurring in the inferior joint space. If now you take your jaw and you jut it out, that's translation. That translation is taking place predominantly in the superior joint space. It's important for you to understand these two concepts because when we try to diagnose temporomandibular joint problems, we often use the fact that there is lack of rotation or lack of translation as a diagnostic criteria to determine problems when the temporomandibular joint is not working normally. So, I hope this helps explain a little bit about the uh, growth, the function of the TMJ, and the book, of course, has more detailed information, and 
We want you to go to the book now and fill in the gaps. Thanks.